born and raised in the New York area, uh, the daughter of an Episcopal priest, grew up in a historic Episcopal parish, which certainly gave me a beautiful formation in the Christian faith, and yet I, I found myself leaving it, perhaps just to explore and see what else was there. Um, and also because I wasn't quite getting the full wraparound feeling of the church. It wasn't embracing every aspect of my life. So there was kind of the secular part of life, and then there was the church part, and they weren't in conversation, they weren't integrated. Um, so as Father Moses said, it seemed like there were pages missing from the book. I like that analogy a lot. So there were just some pages missing. So I, I read about different things. Um, I joined a group of other seekers. We found Orthodoxy together. And um, were catechized through a dogmatic theology textbook. And were greatly influenced by the life and witness of Archbishop John Maximovich, um, Father Seraphim Rose, who famously said, truth is a person, and that orthodoxy is of the heart. It's not a matter of who learns the most facts or gets it right. It's a matter of transforming the heart. And so that was in the 80s. how I came to the Orthodox faith. Yeah, it certainly was not a lifelong dream, but when I read about the Deaconesses in the early church, that really excited me. That really excited me. And the idea of being a woman living in the city, in a life dedicated to Christ, serving other women primarily. Um, that was kind of what I wanted, and yet that deaconess order isn't, isn't practiced now the way it is in the, in the early church. It's, it's sort of evolved into monasticism. And so even though most monastics leave the life of the city go to a remote area, find community there. Um, God provided a context where I could live very much the life of the deaconess that I had been looking for through monasticism in the city. Well, the story of Jesus Christ leading up to his birth and afterwards, um, Africa plays a big part the sojourn of the Hebrew people in Egypt, Christ and his mother and foster father fleeing to Egypt, um, the bringing of the early Christian faith to East Egypt and Ethiopia, all those Mediterranean areas. Um, it has deep roots in Africa. And as I was explaining in my talk last night, the Orthodox approach to reaching out to other cultures is based on a deep respect of other cultures and other people, a deep love for other people and the cultures that formed them. And so it's not based on cultural imperialism. I won't say that never happens, but that's not, that happens I think in spite of our best theology, not because of it. And it's not based on a total depravity concept where you have to break down the person, the language, the culture, the, the primitive religion, everything, and kind of go back to a stem cell of a person to form them in Christianity because everything up until then was so corrupt and so horrible. It's not like that. So orthodoxy has the ability and, and has, in fact, deeply respected the person, including uh, African persons and people of African descent in a way that um, 
Western theology that has that total depravity DNA in it hasn't been able to do. Orthodoxy does not have, did not participate in the slave trade. So there's none of that baggage and none of that history of that. Quite the contrary, um, Orthodox people have been subjugated by um, different regimes for almost half of the existence, 800 years, is what one of our speakers was just telling us. So orthodoxy is a relationship, is a, is a faith that understands suffering. It's not a prosperity gospel. It doesn't say if you're suffering, you must have done something wrong, so it's your fault. It understands suffering. It has compassion for suffering. It has love for the sufferer. We understand that uh, whatever is done to someone is done to Christ because every individual is an icon of Christ. And so if people are made to suffer, then Christ is suffering in and with them. So we're not blaming the victim. So there are many things uh, in Orthodoxy that can fill in the mis missing pages. Uh, we, we have the capacity to deeply respect uh, what Father Moses calls the slave religion, that our ancestors who came through the crucible of slavery discovered some by the Holy Spirit. They may have affiliated with the name of a certain Protestant jurisdiction, but it doesn't mean that it's the same as the mainstream jurisdiction back then. They may have, there be maybe more rapprochement now that black pastors can go to the seminaries and, and so on, but in the early days, a lot of that religion given to the slaves seems to have been given by the Holy Spirit. Scriptures were put in people's heart. People were taught to say the Jesus prayer, to say, Lord, have mercy, and they were being flogged. And so there's a great affinity, actually, a natural affinity for orthodoxy. We have so many African saints that we venerate, that we paint icons of, that we put in murals in our churches. Yes, St. Moses the Black, but many others. And um, the African tradition of the veneration of ancestors, you know, has its completion in the veneration of saints. And we can, on the one hand, retain a respect and love for our ancestors who came through the crucible of the Middle Passage and, uh, and slavery and the spiritual heights that some of them reached through that and love them and respect them, thank them for helping us to be where we are today and we can venerate the saints. So we can, um, when African Americans move into orthodoxy, we can have a completion of something that's already very rich, building on the foundation that's already there. I'm kind of stuck with that word appeal because our consumer culture is based on appealing to people. It's based on appealing to people. And the problem with appealing to people is that the larger consumer culture has learned that to be profitable, you appeal to people's passions. I remember the logo of a soft drink, obey your thirst. Well, in orthodoxy, we say fast. Don't drink anything before communion. You're not obeying your thirst. Orthodoxy doesn't actually appeal to people. Orthodoxy can help save people from the domination of the passions and bring out the true icon of Christ from within the soul, which is a painful process. It's joyful and it's painful. Music, music, and arts. I think it was Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky who said, beauty will save the world. The Orthodox Church is beautiful. It's beautiful. 
when St. Vladimir of Russia was looking um, for what faith would, would help his people, realizing that they, they were growing beyond the pagan gods of their forefathers. Um, he sent emissaries to many different places, including the Hagia Sophia, and when they walked in there, they didn't know if they were in heaven or in earth because the beauty transported them so much. And they came back and said, this is, this is the true faith. This is the faith of our people. And uh, the Orthodox Church has that beauty that just awakens longing in the soul. We have it in the icons. We have it in the liturgy. We have it in the music. And in the music, we have room for the African-American uh, experience of worship music. And so people are being inspired by the Holy Spirit in different contexts in the United States to use either the Negro spirituals or in some cases the gospel music as an inspiration for liturgical music. So Dr. Thunder Wallace premiered uh, uh, gospel, uh, Vespers in a gospel setting. I think that was in February of 2020. Um, I've been working with Dr. Jana Lehman on composing and uh, her Illinois Orthodox Choir has been performing um, the Theotokian from an anaphora and a Palileos and an Our Father and um, true became, and there's more coming. And there are other composers also that we talk about in uh, Jubilation Cultures of Sacred Music that was just released this weekend. So we have interviews. We really talk about all the composers who've been inspired, inspired by American folk music and or spirituals that we're aware of, and then have interviews with Benedict Sheehan and Nazo Zakik in terms of how African-American culture has inspired these two foremost composers. So music, the love of the arts, the love of beauty, just the awakening, awakening of that heavenly longing, that is something that um, is there in the Orthodox Church and beginning a movement toward finding inspiration in African-American musical and worship culture.